Section 4 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Isabella of Angoulême, Part 2. The tragedy of the unfortunate family of de Brios was occasioned by the resistance of the parents to these ordinances in 1211. King John had demanded the eldest son of William de Brios, Lord of Bramber, in Sussex, as a page to wait on Queen Isabella, meaning him in reality as a hostage for his father's allegiance. When the king's message was delivered at Bramber by a courtier, who bore the ominous name of Maluk, the imprudent lady de Breos declared in his hearing that she would not surrender her children to a king who had murdered his own nephew. The words of the unfortunate mother were duly reported by the malicious messenger. The lady de Breos repented of her rashness when it was too late, and strove in vain to propitiate Queen Isabella by rich gifts. Among other offerings, she sent the queen a present of a herd of four hundred cows and one beautiful bull. This peerless herd was white as milk, all but the ears, which were red. This strange present to Isabella did not avert the deadly wrath of King John, for he seized the unfortunate family at Meath in Ireland, whither they had fled for safety. The Lord of Bramber, his wife and children, were conveyed to the old castle at Windsor, and enclosed in a strong room, where they were deliberately starved to death. Father, mother, and five innocent little ones suffered in our England, the fate of Count Ugolino and his family, an atrocity compared with which the dark stain of Arthur's murder fades to the hue of a venial crime. The passion of John for his queen, though it was sufficiently strong to embroil him in war, was not exclusive enough to secure conjugal fidelity. The king tormented her with jealousy, while on his part he was far from setting her a good example, for he often invaded the honor of the female nobility. The name of the lover of Isabella has never been ascertained, nor is it clear that she was ever guilty of any dereliction from ricissitude. But John revenged the wrong that, perhaps, only existed in his malignant imagination, in a manner peculiar to himself. He made his mercenaries assassinate the person whom he suspected of supplanting him in the queen's affections, with two others supposed to be accomplices, and secretly hung their bodies over the bed of Isabella. Her surprise and terror when she discovered them may be imagined, though it is not described by the monastic writers, who darkly allude to this dreadful scene. After this awful tragedy, the queen was consigned to captivity, being conveyed to Gloucester Abbey, under the ward of one of her husband's mercenary leaders. In a record roll of King John, he directs Theodoric de Tais to go to Gloucester with Our Lady Queen, and there keep her in the chamber where the Princess Joanna had been nursed, till he heard further from him. Joanna was born in 1210, according to the majority of the chroniclers. The queen's disgrace was about two years after the birth of her daughter. The queen had brought John a lovely family, but the birth of his children failed to secure her against harsh treatment. She was at this time the mother of two sons and a daughter. Isabella inherited the province of Angoumoy in the year 1213, at which time it is probable that a reconciliation took place between the queen and her husband, since her mother, the Countess of Angoulême, came to England and put herself under the protection of John. Soon after, he went to Angoulême with Isabella. To facilitate the restoration of the Poictevin provinces, again seized by Philip Augustus, John found it necessary to form an alliance with his former rival, Count Hugh de Lusignan. Although that nobleman had been set at liberty some years, he perversely chose to remain a bachelor, in order to remind all the world of the perfidy of that faithless beauty who had broken her betrothment for a crown. The only stipulation which could induce him to assist King John was that he would give him the eldest daughter of Isabella as a wife in the place of the mother. In compliance with this singular request, 
the infant princess Joanna was betrothed to him immediately, and forthwith delivered to him, that she might be educated and brought up in one of his castles, as her mother had been before her. After this alliance, Count Hugh effectually cleared the Poictevin borders of the French invaders, and King John, flushed with his temporary success, returned with his queen, to plague England with new acts of tyranny. Although the most extravagant prince in the world in regard to his own personal expenses, John was parsimonious enough towards his beautiful queen. In one of his wardrobe rolls there is an order for a gray cloth pelisson for Isabella, guarded with nine bars of gray fur. In King John's wardrobe roll is a warrant for giving out cloth, to make two robes for the queen, each to consist of eight L's, one of green cloth, the other of brunette. The green robe, lined with sendel or sarsenet, is considered worth sixty shillings. The king likewise orders for his queen, cloth for a pair of purple sandals, and four pair of women's boots, one pair to be embroidered in circles round the ankles. There is, likewise, an item for the repair of Isabella's mirror. The dress of John was costly and glittering in the extreme, for he was, in addition to other follies and frailties, the greatest fop in Europe. At one of his Christmas festivals, he appeared in a red satin mantle, embroidered with sapphires and pearls, a tunic of white damask, a girdle set with garnets and sapphires, while the baldric that crossed from his left shoulder to sustain his sword was set with diamonds and emeralds, and his white gloves were adorned, one with a ruby, and the other with a sapphire. The richness of King John's dress, and the splendor of his jewelry, partly occasioned the extravagant demands he made on the purses of his people, both church and laity. He supplied his wants by a degree of corruption, that proves him utterly insensible to every feeling of honor, both as a man and a king, and shamelessly left rolls and records whereby posterity were enabled to read such entries as the following ludicrous specimens of bribery. Robert de Faux gave five of his best palfreys, that the king might hold his tongue about Henry Pinnell's wife. What tale of scandal King John had the opportunity of telling, deponent saith not, but the entry looks marvelously undignified, in regal accounts, and shows that shame as well as honor was dead in the heart of John. To the Bishop of Winchester is given one ton of good wine, for not putting the king in mind to give a girdle to the Countess of Albemarle. The scarcity of coin, and absence of paper money, made bribery remarkably shameless in those days. Palfrey's prancing at the levy, and the four hundred milk-white kind of the unfortunate Lady de Breos, lowing before the windows of Isabella, must have had an odd effect. The queen, soon after her return to England in 1214, was superseded in the fickle heart of her husband, by the unfortunate beauty of Matilda Fitzwalter, surnamed the Fair. The abduction of this lady, who, to do her justice, thoroughly abhorred the royal felon, was the exploit which completed the exasperation of the English barons, who flew to arms for the purpose of avenging the honor of the most distinguished among their class, Lord Fitzwalter, father of the fair victim of John. Every one knows that, clad in steel, they met their monarch John at Runnymede, and there, in happy hour, made the fell tyrant feel his people's power. The unfortunate Matilda, who had roused the jealousy of the queen, and excited the lawless passion of John, was supposed to be murdered by him, in the spring of the year 1215. After the signature of Magna Carta, King John retired in a rage to his fortress at Windsor, the scene of many of his secret murders. Here he gave way to tempests of personal fury, resembling his father's bursts of passion. He execrated his birth, and, seizing sticks and clubs, vented his maniacal feelings by biting and gnawing them, and then breaking them in pieces. While these emotions were raging, mischief matured itself in his soul, for after passing a sleepless night at Windsor, he departed for the Isle of Wight, where he sullenly awaited the arrival of some bands of mercenaries he had sent for from Brabant and Guienne, with whose assistance he meant to revenge himself on the barons. In the fair isle John passed whole days, idly sauntering on the beach, chatting familiarly with the fishers, 
and even joining in piratical expeditions with them against his own subjects. He was absent some weeks, everyone thought he was lost, and few wished he might ever be found. He emerged from his concealment in good earnest, when his mercenary troops arrived, and then he began that atrocious progress across the island, always alluded to by his contemporaries with horror. One trait of his conduct shall serve for a specimen of the rest. The king every morning took delight in firing, with his own hands, the house that had sheltered him the preceding night. In the midst of this diabolical career, he reconciled himself to Isabella, whom he had kept in a state of palace restraint ever since the abduction of Matilda the Fair. The queen advanced as far as Marlborough to meet him, where they abode some days, at the royal palace on the forest of Savernake, which was one of the principal dower castles of our queens. At this time there is an intimation on the record rolls that the new buildings at the queen's castle on Savernake were completed, among which were kitchens, with fireplaces for roasting oxen whole. John consigned to the care of Isabella, at this time, his heir prince, Henry, with whom she retired to Gloucester, where the rest of the royal children were abiding. The queen had, in the year 1214, become the mother of a second daughter, and in the succeeding year she gave birth to the princess Isabella. Scarcely had the queen retreated to the strong city of Gloucester when that invasion by Prince Louis of France took place, which is so well known in general history. The barons, driven to desperation by John's late outrages, offered the heir of France the crown, if he would aid them against their tormentor. Hunted into an obscure corner of his kingdom, in the autumn of 1216, King John confided his person and regalia to the men of Lynn in Norfolk. But as his affairs summoned him northward, he crossed the wash to Swinshead Abbey in Lincolnshire. The tide coming in unexpectedly swept away part of his army and baggage. His splendid regalia was swallowed in the devouring waters, and John himself scarcely escaped with life. The king arrived at Swinshead Abbey, unwell and dispirited, and withal, in a malignant ill temper. As he sat at meat in the abbot's refectory, he gave vent to his spleen by saying that he hoped to make the halfpenny loaf cost a shilling before the year was over. A Saxon monk heard this malicious speech with indignation. If the evidence of contemporary historians may be believed, John uttered this folly at dinner, and before his dessert was ended, he was poisoned in a dish of autumn pears. In all probability, the king was seized with one of his severe typhus fevers, often endemic in the fenny countries, at the close of the year. The symptoms of alternate cold and heat, detailed by the chroniclers, approximate closely with that disease. Whether by the visitation of God, or through the agency of man, the fact is evident, that King John was stricken with a fatal illness at Swin's head. But, sick as he was, he ordered himself to be put in a litter, and carried forward in his northern progress. At Newark he could proceed no further, but gave himself up to the fierce attacks of the malady. He sent for the abbot and monks of Croxton, and made full confession of all his sins, no slight undertaking. He then forgave his enemies, and enjoined those about him to charge his son, Henry, to do the same. And after taking the Eucharist, and making all his officers swear fealty to his eldest son, he expired commending his soul to God, and his body to burial in Worcester Cathedral, according to his especial directions, close to the grave of St. Wolstan, a Saxon bishop, of great reputation for sanctity, lately canonized. The vicinity of the dying king, evidently considered likely to be convenient, for keeping his corpse from the attacks of the evil one, whom he had indefatigably served during his life. His contemporary historians do not seem to think that this arrangement, however prudently planned, was likely to be effectual in altering his destination. As one of them sums up his character in these words of terrific energy, hell felt itself defiled by the presence of John. The queen and the royal children were at Gloucester when the news of the king's death arrived. Isabella and the Earl of Pembroke immediately caused Prince Henry to be proclaimed, in the streets of that city. 
In the coronation letter of Henry the Third is preserved the memory of a very prudent step, taken by Isabella as queen mother. As the kingdom was in an unsettled and tumultuous state, and as she was by no means assured of the safety of the young king, she provided for the security of both her sons, by sending her son Richard to Ireland, which was at that time loyal and tranquil. The boy king says in his proclamation, The lady queen, our mother, has upon advice, and having our assent to it, sent our brother Richard to Ireland, yet so that you and our kingdom can speedily see him again. Only nine days after the death of John, the queen caused her young son to be crowned in the cathedral of Gloucester. Although so recently a widow, the extreme exigencies of the times forced Isabella to assist at her child's coronation. The regal diadem belonging to his father, being lost in Lincoln washes, and the crown of Edward the Confessor being far distant in London, the little king was crowned with a gold throat collar belonging to his mother. A very small part of England recognized the claims of Isabella's son. Even Gloucester was divided. The citizens who adhered to the young king, being known by the cross of Aquitaine, cut in white cloth on their breasts. Henry was then just nine years old, though likely to be a minor for some years. It must be observed that the queen mother was offered no share in the government, and as queens of England had frequently acted as regents, during the absence of their husbands or sons, this exclusion is a proof that the English held Isabella in little esteem. London and the adjacent counties were then in the hands of Louis of France. Among other possessions, he held the Queen's Dower Palace of Berkhamsted, which was strongly garrisoned with French soldiers. However, the valor and wisdom of the protector Pembroke, and the intrepidity of Hubert de Berg, in a few months cleared England of these intruders. Before her year of widowhood had expired, Isabella retired to her native city, Angoulême, July 1217. The Princess Joanna resided in the vicinity of her mother's domains, being at Valence, the capital of the Count de la Marche. Nothing could be more singular than the situation of Queen Isabella, as mother to the promised bride of Count Hugh, and that bride but seven years old. The valiant Lusignan himself was absent from his territories, venting his superfluous combativeness, and soothing his crosses in love, by a crusade which he undertook in 1216. The demise of his father obliged him to revisit Poitou in 1220, where he was frequently in company with the Queen of England, who was at the same time his false love, and the mother of his little wife. Isabella, at the age of thirty-four, still retained that marvellous beauty which had caused her to be considered the Helen of the Middle Ages. It is therefore no great wonder that she quickly regained her old place in the constant heart of the valiant marcher. Accordingly, we find this notation in Matthew of Westminster, that in the year of 1220, or about that time, Isabella, Queen Dowager of England, having before crossed the seas, took to her husband, her former spouse, the Count of Marche, in France, without leave of her son, the king, or his council. As the queen took this step without asking the consent of any one in England, the council of regency withheld her dower from her, to the indignation of her husband. A very few months afforded them an opportunity of righting this wrong. The countess queen and the count de la Marche had still retained at Valence the little Joanna, who had been deprived by her mother of her mature bridegroom. But it so happened that the council of Henry the Third greatly needed the restoration of the princess, in order to make peace with Alexander, king of Scotland, upon which King Henry took the opportunity of writing a congratulatory epistle to his mother on her marriage, and demanding the restoration of his sister. But Queen Isabella, highly incensed at the deprivation of her jointure, positively refused to give up the princess. The young king then wrote to the Pope, earnestly requesting him to excommunicate his mother and father-in-law. The latter he vituperated as a very Judas. Before the Pope complied with this dutiful request, he inquired a little into the merits of the case, and found that Henry the Third had deprived his royal mother of all, in England and Guienne, 
that appertained to her as the widow of King John, because she did not ask his leave to marry a second time, and as he was only fourteen, that was scarcely to be expected. After a most voluminous correspondence between the contending parties, on the King of Scots declaring he would not be pacified without a wife from the royal family, Henry was glad to make up the difference with his mother, by paying her arrears of jointure, and receiving from the Count de la Marche, the Princess Joanna. The King of France was liege lord of Count de la Marche, but the Countess Queen was infuriated, whenever she saw her husband arrayed against the territories of her son, and her sole study was, how French Poitou could be rendered independent of the King of France. She was a queen, she said, and she disdained to be the wife of a man who had to kneel before another. Another cause of violent irritation existed. Prince Alfonso, the brother of the King of France, had refused her daughter, by the Count de la Marche, and married Jane of Toulouse. On this occasion, King Louis created his brother, Count of Poitiers, and required the Count de la Marche, as possessor of Poitou, to do him homage. Isabella manifested great disdain at the heiress of Toulouse, taking precedence of her, the crown queen of England, mother, as she said, of a king and an empress. From that time she suffered the unfortunate Count de la Marche to have no domestic peace, till he transferred his allegiance from Louis the Ninth to her son Henry the Third, who undertook the conquest of French Poitou at the instigation of his mother. Several years of disastrous warfare ensued. The husband of Isabella nearly lost his whole patrimony, while the district of the Angamoy was overrun by the French. After King Henry the Third lost the Battle of Talaborg, fought on the banks of Isabella's native river, the sparkling Charente. A series of defeats followed, which utterly dispossessed both the queen mother and her husband of their territories. Henry the Third fled to Bordeaux, scarcely deeming himself safe in that city, while the queen mother, whose pride had occasioned the whole catastrophe, had no resource but to deliver herself up to the mercy of the king of France. The Count de la Marche had fought like a lion, but his valor availed little, when the minds of his people were against the war. In this dilemma, the Countess Queen and her Lord determined to send their heir, the young Hugh de Lusignan, to see how King Louis seemed disposed towards them. This amiable monarch received the son of his enemies with such benevolence, that the Count de la Marche, taking his wife and the rest of the children with him, to the camp of St. Louis, threw themselves at his feet, and were very kindly received, on no worse conditions, than doing homage to Prince Alfonso, for three castles. It might have been supposed that the restless spirit of Isabella was tamed by these disasters, but soon after, in 1244, the life of King Louis was twice attempted. The last time the assassins were convicted, and before their execution, confessed that they had been so borne, by Queen Isabella, to poison the good king of France. Isabella gave color to the accusation by flying for sanctuary to the Abbey of Fontaraude, where she hid in the secret chamber and lived at her ease, says Matthew Paris, though the Poic de Vin and French, considering her as the origin of the disastrous war with France, called her by no other name than Jezebel, instead of her rightful appellation of Isabel. Matthew says, the whole brunt of this disgraceful business fell upon her unfortunate husband and son. They were seized, and about to be tried on this accusation of poisoning, when Count de la Marche made appeal to battle, and offered to prove in combat, with his accuser Alfonso, brother of St. Louis, that his wife was belied. Alfonso, who appears to have had no great stomach to the fray, declined it, on the plea that Count Hugh was so treason-spotted, it would be pollution to fight with him. Then Isabella's young son Hugh dutifully offered to fight, in the place of his sire, and Alfonso actually appointed the day and place to meet him. Nevertheless, he again withdrew, excusing himself on the plea of the infamy of the family. This sad news, says old Matthew, for evil tidings hasten fast, soon reached the ears of Isabella, in the secret chamber of Fontevraud. The affront offered to her brave young son seems to have broken the heart of Isabella. She never came out of the secret chamber again, but, assuming the veil, 
died of a decay brought on by grief in the year 1246. As a penance for her sins, she desired to be buried humbly in the common cemetery of Fontevraud. Some years afterwards, her son, Henry III, visiting the tombs of his ancestors at Fontevraud, was shocked at being shown the lowly grave of his mother. He raised for her a stately tomb, with a fine enameled statue, in the choir of Fontevraud, near Henry II and Eleonora of Aquitaine, her mother-in-law. Her statue is of fine proportions, clad in flowing garments, confined to the waist by a girdle. She wears the wimple veil, and conventual frontlet. Her face is oval, with regular and majestic features. The Count de la Marche survived his unhappy partner but till the year 1249. The enmity between him and the family of St. Louis entirely disappeared after the death of Isabella, for her husband shared the crusade that the King of France made at Damietta, and fell, covered with wounds, in one of the eastern battles, fighting by the side of his old antagonist, Alfonso, Count of Poictiers. Isabella left several children by this marriage, five sons, and at least three daughters. Her eldest son, by the Count de la Marche, succeeded not only his father's patrimony, but to his mother's inheritance of Angamoy. He is reckoned in the genealogy of Lusignan as Hugh the Ninth, Count de la Marche, and Angoulême. The Count de la Marche sent all his younger sons, with his daughter Alice, to Henry the Third, who provided for them very liberally, to the great indignation of his subjects. End of section 4